Hi there, welcome to the latest edition of The Front Page. In this week's show, we will be having our final reflections on this year's Cheltenham Festival, our first thoughts on this year's flat season, and we'll be looking at the case of the footballer who is no longer wanted on Britain's race courses. If you're watching on YouTube, we'd love it if you would like, comment, share and subscribe. And there'll be plenty for you to comment on based on the things said by myself, Lee Mottersed, and my esteemed Racing Post colleagues, Maddie Playle and Jonathan Harding. Are you both well? We are now. <laughs> by the sounds of it, we've both been a bit ill, but we're back and firing on all cylinders, Lee, yeah. Yeah, they, they have both been poorly. I had the, the sniffles uh, last week, but not nearly as bad as my two colleagues have been. But they are now both raring to go, and Jonathan is raring to go with talk of the Cheltenham Festival. Yeah, so you'll have no doubt seen that a lot has been said and written about the Cheltenham Festival mm. since it finished. Um, good, but mostly bad or constructive, depending on what side of it you're looking at. Um, this really is prompted by a piece written by Chris Cook, which is probably the most comprehensive, I think, look at the Cheltenham Festival and what it did well and what it could improve on next time. Um, that was published on Sunday uh, in, in the Big Read. And look, the issues have been well documented. The idea that the race course experience no longer tallies with the cost. Um, and by cost, I mean ticket price, hotels, all the rest of it. Um, this idea that the less competitive racing is a turn off to punters and race goers. Willie Mullins obviously cleaning up on the first two days. And also, the, the probably the biggest thing that we saw on social media was this uh, car park debacle, which probably more has been written about car parks uh, this month than any other month ever. But all interesting points um, and all point to the fact that people care very deeply about the Cheltenham Festival. They want it to be as good as it can possibly be. It is incredibly important to British racing and it probably didn't get everything right this year, I think it's fair to say. Now, the piece was interesting because Chris spoke to a number of senior figures about what can be done about these various headers, attendances, competitiveness and all the rest of it. And I think I'd just like to sort of raise some of the interesting ideas there. One was that the Jockey Club will be meeting with hotels to try and create a discussion there about if you price people out of staying in Cheltenham then you're basically killing the golden goose. Another uh, one of the tangents to this is relates to the race programme. National Hunt Chase seems to be the one on the chopping block at the moment with most people didn't perform particularly well from a betting perspective. It's, we're, we're a long way out from the festival now. There's a lot of discussion about it. I think it's important as well just to note that there does need to be some perspective. A lot of people did still go. There are things that do need to drastically improve, but it can be a little bit self-defeating if you're too negative. That said, we wouldn't be doing our job, I don't think, if we didn't pick out some of the the things that I've mentioned there as, as needing fixing. So it's an interesting time and it, it seems that the festival is at a bit of a crossroads and yeah, I'd welcome your thoughts on, on any of those sort of headline topics that came out of it. Yeah, um, well, um, I, th I think what it, important point to stress is that, it, like you say, people did have still have a, a good time. A lot of people still went. I, I put my column a week last Monday that it, it wasn't like having root canal surgery going to the Cheltenham Festival. It's still a, it's still a fabulous thing. But we, we talk about um, great festivals, vintage festivals. Well, not every festival can be great or vintage, or great or vintage wouldn't mean anything. There has to be, um, there has to be both sides of the, the, the spectrum for it to, to have a, uh, for great to mean anything. And I don't think it was a, a great festival. It was a perfectly good Cheltenham festival, but not one that we're going to remember um, as um, one of the vintage renewals. Um, lots of individual issues to, to pick up on. What I thought was interesting reading Chris's piece, Maddie, was that um, Ian Renton, the managing director um, uh, of Cheltenham, the, the boss of Cheltenham, um, and Edward Gillespie, who held that role for a, a long time and is widely regarded and rightly regarded as a man who did a huge amount to reinvigorate the Cheltenham Festival and to take it to this almost otherworldly um, event alongside Channel 4 when Channel 4 came in as the festival's broadcast partner in 1995. They both seem to feel that criticism of this year's meeting had been exaggerated, um, that a lot of the problems that, that the Jockey Club encountered this year weren't necessarily a fault of the, of the, of the Jockey Club and that um, the economy had been 
the main factor. And Edward was talking about how he doesn't even think that some of the the smaller fields and the changing nature of the big races is a bad thing because horses tend to go on more than they did in the past from those races. It's probably the case, isn't it, that some of the criticism has been excessive, but equally that there is a there is a real problem there. Yeah, I, I firstly disagree with that statement that these races changing and crucially nothing being done to um, address that is a good thing. Um, and I think that's that's clear to see. You mentioned talking about, you know, how every year is not going to be a vintage year. I take that, but I also think that we now have evidence that this horse population, the dynamics of it are incredibly different to yeah. what we had many years ago. And there haven't been changes put in place to address that and to fit that. Rather, we're going in the, the other direction. And it wasn't so long ago that they were discussing the, the potential of a five-day festival, which just seems absolutely barking mad now. Um, I think one of the, the ways I can talk about it, I guess, is that I didn't actually go in 2023 when we had that marvellous Tuesday with Honeysuckle mm -hmm. and Constitution Hill. And um, morale was high, excitement was high. It was an incredibly emotional um, wonderful day of sporting action. I imagine that this year's Tuesday of the Cheltenham Festival was incredibly different. I had a good time. Um, I enjoyed it. I wasn't there in a working capacity on the Tuesday or the Wednesday when I, uh, I was on the Wednesday when I attended. Um, but I think even withstanding the difference in um, sort of atmosphere and excitement and anticipation and just a, a feeling amongst the crowd. It was definitely palpable on, on Tuesday and Wednesday this year. It seemed quieter. Um, the racing just didn't seem to capture the imagination like it once had done. And there are a different array of issues, you know, Jonathan mentioned there, and they're not all linked together. But for me, the number one thing that I would want to see change would be, as Cheltenham and the Jockey Club have, have vowed to do and said to do, is to look back at the at the race program and address um, the, the changes there, potentially, you know, changing the program around. Um, because for me, that is the the number one thing um, that that Cheltenham can do, I think, to, to appeal more. I take the point definitely about pricing. And I think Charlie Parker made a really good point in Chris's piece also about making affordable packages for punters and really trying to um, you know, make it a package deal and, and sell it in a, in a different way. And I think that could be very interesting tied with hotel prices being sort of looked at. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that there are going to naturally be some years that are better than others. But as I think even Julie Harrington herself recognised by releasing that statement after the festival, um, this year's is not a route that we want to continue going down without any changes. No, I think you're right. Um, Nigel Payne was also very big on that idea of packages, trying to encourage people to attend. Um, if we just look firstly at the, the actual racing programme, um, a lot of people have had a lot of ideas about how this can be uh, improved. Uh, our Irish editor, Richie Forrestal, outlined his uh, his dream programme of six races over four days, losing some races, changing some others. Um, there seems to be, I think, common acceptance among most people, perhaps not yet the jockey club, I don't know, that there are too many options for the better horses and that it's too easy for horses um, to be kept apart from each other. The fact that um, uh, grade one novices, um, now they're, they're always going to have options because there's always been the, the Sun Alliance, sorry, the, the old days, the Sun Alliance novices hurdle and the, the Supreme novices hurdle, but now there are uh, three grade one novice hurdles apart from the Triumph. You've got four grade one opportunities for novice chases. That seems to be um, too many. The National Hunt Chase is one that has been particularly picked up on. Simon Clare, um, who's the, the, the leads comms for uh, Labrooks and Coral, says in Chris's piece that that race should go. And there's surely no doubt that the National Hunt Chase as it is now, which is very different, different from what the National Hunt Chase as it used to be, is surplus to requirements. You know, you have a horse like Corbett's Cross hosing up in that race. Well, he really should have been in the Brown Advisory over, you know, the three mile grade one novice chase. The National Chase as it is now is not needed. Is that I, right? I, is that? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, if you're, if you're a 
a high quality horse like Corbett's Cross, then you can you can run in the in the Brown Advisory. Um, and if you're not, then you've got other handicap options like the yeah. Ultima and the Kim Muir. Um, it wasn't so long ago that we were seeing horses of the calibre of Native River, Manella Rocco running in the National Hunt Chase, but already that seems to have very quickly changed. Now, Corbett's Cross is a very high class horse, but that's only going to be a rewarding race to watch if he is against fellow high class horses and the competitiveness of it in recent years. The field sizes have gone down. Um, it just doesn't seem to be serving its purpose correctly and it could add an awful lot to other races if it no longer existed. So I see that for sure. Um, I also think there's a conversation to be had around having a mayor's final and having the mayor's series, but maybe taking it away from Cheltenham so that the mayors could be fed into the open contest with their weight allowances. I think that's a really valid point. I don't necessarily think we should get rid of it altogether. But at the Cheltenham Festival, where the best are to compete against the best, it should be the absolute elite. Um, there's no question that Lossy Mouth, for instance, should not have been running in that mare's herd. Um, Patrick Mullins, I thought, made a, some really interesting points in his piece in the, in the, in the Post um, last week. He's part of the, 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 the team that dominated the festival with, with nine wins, and yet... Patrick was clear in saying that he didn't think it felt like it probably ought to have felt mm. that the euphoria um, that he experienced, even when winning the champion bumper, wasn't as, as great as he had for some other wins um, this season. And he raised some ideas. One of the, 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 the thread that seemed to run through his piece was that there were too many instances of very high class, talented novices running in handicaps, which he doesn't think they should have been able to run in horses if, who'd had um, the, uh, the maximum requirement of four runs in novice races running in handicaps. And he seemed to be suggesting that he would change um, those, the, the, those handicap criteria so that those good novices actually run against other good novices in the championship novice races. That makes sense? Yeah, it, it's an interesting idea. I'm not sure Willie, he ran it past Willie Mullins first <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's not a loophole. It's a, good bit of race planning isn't it and it makes sense to do that I think from a competitiveness standpoint then definitely yeah. you know you want novices running against novices you want the handicaps to be um, as competitive as possible uh, I just I think it lives and dies on that doesn't it you want especially at the Cheltenham Festival all year round but especially at the Cheltenham Festival people want to see the best horses fine but they also want to see f healthy field sizes we, we can't have four or five six horses running against one another at Cheltenham. It has to be big fields. That's what the punters are after. That's what is borne out in the betting data, that they like getting stuck into races that have a lot of options, a lot of different runners from different yards. We can't have a monopoly from one yard and we can't have races that are predictable. Yeah, and I, I certainly think that there is merit in the BHA and the Jockey Club looking at that, that idea of should the criteria of handicaps be changed, so that the horses have to have more runs. Um, over hurdles or fences before going into those races. Um, just in, in a general sense, um, a lot of the criticism that the Jockey Club face over the Cheltenham Festival related to um, cost and experience. The experience in the car parks was, was evidently regrettable um, uh, during the week. Ju the Jockey Club said they spent a fortune on trackway. It wasn't enough, but they made the point that it's an, it's an outdoor event and in the green belt there's only so much you can do that was that was their perspective in terms of cost um they seem pretty relaxed about the the cost of attending the Cheltenham festival and it is true that for comparative sporting events you probably pay the same sometimes even more i think with hindsight they probably would have looked at the the initial entry level cost of the best mates and tax enclosures because that's where they were really being hit hard. Corporate sales were great during the Cheltenham Festival. At that end of the, of the, of the market, there was no tr problem at all. It's at the, the bottom end of the market where they really hit hard. And that's probably why they've frozen uh, early bird offers for uh, early bird prices for, for 2025. Um, the accommodation cost is, is a big thing. John, you referenced the fact that they're going to be talking to um, hotels in, in Cheltenham. There was one stat that was put to me whereby uh, there was a 13% drop in advanced sales from people living over 100 miles from Cheltenham 
whereas advanced sales from people living within 25 miles of Cheltenham hadn't really been touched at all. So that definitely adds to that feel that people coming from further away were put off by the cost of attending or staying in Cheltenham for the festival. The town was incredibly quiet compared to, to, to previous years. I guess the problem with that, Maddie, is you, you can't force Mr. Mr. Holiday Inn or Mr. Doubletree by Hilton to say, can you just please halve your costs because they become obscenely high. Yeah, and I think also another point to back that up is the Irish um, interest yeah. was, was significantly down this year. And when you look at a festival like the Cheltenham Festival and compare it to the Dublin Racing Festival, where, let's be honest, there were similar issues this year in that there were small fields and short price favourites yeah. and certain trainers dominating. Um, but when that experience seems to be more affordable, of course it is if you're, if you're living in Ireland and you don't have to pay for transport and accommodation, etc., and also in terms of the experience, i.e. just so happened that this year they didn't get stuck in a car park or they could get a train affordable um, to the race course or a bus or what have you, um, then people are gonna prioritize what they do with their disposable income and Cheltenham's the one who's gonna be missing out. So it, it makes sense to me that, that less Irish people will be coming over because they would be um, more inclined to, to stay close to home and enjoy the Dublin Racing Festival. And I think that's, um, that's a, a real shame because we know how much the, the Irish punters, mm. as just as much as the Irish competitors, um, make to the meeting. Um, just one final point I'd, I'd want to make before we, we move on, is, and this is one I made again a, a week ago, is that um, we can debate left, right and centre why fewer people came and how good or otherwise the 2024 Cheltenham Festival was, but what is a statement of fact is that it, it matters massively because for the jockey club, the Cheltenham Festival is the cash cow. You know, it, it is the event that is critical uh, in, in, its, in its finances every year. And if the jockey club is bringing in less money because of a fall in attendances at the Cheltenham Festival, that will matter. It will matter to how much the jockey club can spend on, um, on, on, on prize money. Um, its prize money commitment will have to be re-examined for uh, for future years um, and also it, 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 it spend on capital projects is impacted by how well or otherwise the the Cheltenham Festival is doing so th there hasn't been so sort of that much public comment on that yet but I, but I'm sure it's it's there that there will be concerns and there will be a need to reevaluate how much can be spent if less is coming in from the Cheltenham Festival. I think that's absolutely spot on. I spoke to Nevin Truesdale on the Friday morning um, and he intimated, I can't remember the exact figure, but the cost of putting on the festival is significantly higher than it was in previous years. Yeah. If you factor that in alongside the fact that fewer people attended and various other challenges that they faced in terms of the, you know, the provisions for the car park and what have you, it, it will have a knock-on effect for the jockey club's finances. They will want to get the festival uh, in a place where they're happy with it. The problem is for them that the bar is higher because it's so important. If this was another meeting, I don't think people would be chewing over the details of it so long after the fact, but it is massively important, not just to the jockey club, to British, uh, but to British racing. I think they did a lot right and probably have come in a little bit unfairly in some corners uh, for criticism in the sense that um, some things are out of their control. They can't control the weather. They can't control yeah. various other things. They can't control the economy. There are things that they can do, but they need to look at that in a data-driven way and not just produce sort of a knee-jerk reaction because somebody on social media was upset about it. They need to have a proper look at it and try and sort of quantify it. I think as well that they've, they've fallen victim to other forces outside of their control in terms of competitiveness. I was listening to you talking there about the the race program and it could very easily have applied to British racing full stop this mm -hmm. idea of horses being able to dodge one another it perhaps not quite well, tallying. It, does. it doesn't quite tally with the horse population you know you could be talking about the Cheltenham program or British racing so there, there are things that need looking at from a wider sport perspective not just the jockey club in Cheltenham but at the same time there are still things tangibly that the jockey club could do for next year's festival and I'm sure they're pouring over it now yeah, serious discussions and um, big decisions, uh, no doubt, over the coming months. OK, that then was our first story. Before we move on to our second story, I wish to advise you that there is a fantastic offer for those wishing to subscribe 
to our Ultimate Members Club. Welcome back to part two of the front page and having discussed the greatest meeting in British horse racing, we're now going to look at something at the other end of the spectrum, a low grade handicap hurdle that took place at Worcester in July. Just as a, uh, a reminder of what happened that day, it was a race in which a horse called Hilsin was very heavily back from 10 to 1 into 2 to 1 before drifting right out again in the contest. He finished third under conditional jockey Dylan Kitts, who made a lot of negative headlines for his riding of the horse that day. Appeared to be tenderly ridden Hilsin in the closing stages before finishing third. The stewards at Worcester and then BHA stewards looked into the contest. Uh, the horse Hilsin was banned from racing for 40 days. Dylan Kitts had his license suspended. The uh, trainer, Chris Honor, uh, was unhappy uh, on the, the day and subsequently asked the owner, Alan Clegg, to remove his horses from the yard. Alan Clegg insisted he had been involved in no wrongdoing whatsoever. That investigation still carries on by the BHA. The reason why the, the story was in the headlines again last week was that it emerged that championship football player Ashley Barnes had been indefinitely disqualified by the BHA alongside his father-in-law John Higgins and the BHA confirmed that Ashley Barnes was the, the footballer who plays for Norwich City who previously was a Premier League footballer for Burnley. John Higgins, I say, is his father-in-law connected to no one uh, of any uh, public uh, celebrity status, uh, in case there was any c confusion there. Um, and it was uh, accepted, uh, understood, that this was in relation to the Hilson case and related to the BHA having sought access to phone records from the individuals concerned. Neither the uh, individuals concerned, Ashley Barnes or John Higgins, have made any public comment, nor have Norwich City. But it is therefore a story because of the, uh, the participation of Ashley Barnes that made a lot of headlines uh, last week, given his status as a well-known footballer. Um, Jonathan Harding, well out of my comfort zone talking about um, well-known footballers, but he is well-known, isn't he? And because of who he is, this made headlines last week. Yeah, he is well known, I'd say. Um, he certainly knew where the goal was in the Premier League, playing for Burnley. Right. Um, so yeah, most people would know him if you're a, a football fan. Um, yeah, it's one of those, isn't it? Whereas only the other week we were saying how brilliant it was seeing Sir Alex Ferguson and Harry Redknapp having winners at the Cheltenham Festival. And before then we had Graham McDowell, the golfer with an, an interest, and Brooks Kepka having a runner at Kep Kempton. And, it's brilliant when you get that cross-sport association with racing, I think, and it's, it, it lends itself for us from a stories perspective, but also just creates that circle of prospective owners, doesn't it, with you know, the likes of um, Harry Redknapp sharing it with, and so Sam Allardyce was at Cheltenham. You have this sort of, this name recognition that does quite well, I think. The flip side of that is when it is a, related to a negative story like this, um, because you'll have seen that Ashley Barnes and his disqualification has made it into pretty much every national newspaper, online, you name it. It's not a great look for racing, not racing's fault of course, and it's dealing with it as it ought to be dealing with it, but it's one of those that's just unfortunate, I think, after having had the, the great footballing stories from the festival. It's a tricky one for the BHA, Maddie, I guess, because as, as ever, with an ongoing investigation, um, regulators don't want to provide a running commentary on what is taking place um, but because the names of Mr Barnes and Mr Higgins um, appeared on the disqualified list there was interest in this and the BHA has confirmed who Mr Barnes is but obviously they can't really say why he's been disqualified. Well it was a, a failure to communicate with them and cooperate with them, wasn't it? To but do they with can't the say records. that. They can't, they, they, they can't um, make quite a, any sort of public background, can they? No, um, but I think, you know, it's that same thing that I tend to go back to in these cases is that 
the more transparency we have, the better. Um, and obviously, when it comes to ongoing cases, you know, we can't always achieve that um, for the for the better end goal. Um, it, it's a shame this story. Obviously, Dylan Kitts is the young rider who was in the middle of it, and he too, I think, failed to to cooperate. Um, his license was rescinded, and then um, he was actually um, going forward and providing information. So got his license back. He got his. Um, yes. He was taken off the disqualified list the following yeah. day. Yeah. So it's. It's a, it's a sad case, really, um, but it's good that the BHA is looking into it, and I'm sure there are lessons that can be learned there. One would hope, Jonathan, that at some point this year that there would be significant developments in this case. In the, in the great scheme of things, it hasn't actually run that long. We're only talking of a race that took place in July last year. Sometimes these cases have taken much longer uh, to, to run their course, and so far... Um, Dylan Kitts is the only participant that's had any sort of um, uh, punishment of it. I mean, it might well be that nobody else gets punished. Maybe that nobody else deserves to be to be punished. But it would be good if, if this case could be resolved as soon as possible. It would, I think, for just the, the integrity of the sport, uh, first straight off the bat, but also for the participants involved, um, whether they've done something wrong or not they are still being dragged through this process um, and the longer it goes on the harder it is for everybody involved and the more grey area you have and the more people will try to guess at what's happened and the, the sort of the conjecture is no good for racing from a, a PR perspective I think you, you're, you're right it's it has to be done properly it has to be done thoroughly but as quickly as possible we saw recently didn't we with the George Gently case and Dan Skelton. Now there were, it's important to note, various mitigating factors there as to why it took so long and civil proceedings and what have you. But it, it needs to be always carried out these investigations as quickly, as thoroughly as possible and as transparently as possible. As soon as the BHA is in a position to say something, I'm sure it will. Um, and then it can be put to bed without too much guessing at what's happened. Because that's where I think the, the problems come in. And it'll be interesting if Ashley Barnes, who was a winning uh, owner in 2021, also breaks his silence on the matter. That then is story two, story three in a second. Before we get to that, a free bets offer. Okay, we have discussed already the Cheltenham Festival. Now we're going to move to the flat because all the Grand National and the Punchy Sound Festival and much more is still to take place in the current jump season. The flat has returned in Ireland and in Britain. We had the Lincoln on Saturday at Doncaster and already, Maddie Playl, some people have been making a big mark. Yeah, I think this year's flat season is going to be really interesting because there's lots of transitioning going on. Lots of people leaving different roles, lots of people joining. Obviously, David Egan's the main one. He is the, the latest retained rider for Ammo Racing, and he won the Lincoln aboard Mr. Professor for Dominic French Davis, which is something you referenced in a, a column um, I noticed this week, Jonathan. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how David does in that new role. He was riding in Ireland on the first day of the Irish turf season um, aboard Arizona Blaze, was one of the first two-year-old winners um, for those connections. Clearly a very powerful operation. We've also got powerful operations like Wathnan Racing, who continue to plough money into the game. They've got a new retain, retain rider in James Doyle, who's left Godolph in second role. Um, Shami Heffernan's left Bali Doyle. Frankie de Tori is... God knows where he's going to be riding out in Dubai this weekend. He's going to ride Bob Baffert's Newgate in the Dubai World Cup. He will be riding Lord North in, in his bid for a fourth Dubai turf, but he won't be riding Emily Upjohn. He's going to be ridden by Kieran Schumach. Is that going to be um, the new way of things at Clare Haven? There's just so much change going on. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the land lies and at a time where we talk about how British racing is struggling, we should focus on the fact that there is key investment in British flat racing at the moment, and that's really exciting. Um, for me, one of the things that struck me this weekend as a key story, given that I've um, worked sort of alongside him on a few occasions, is Sylvester D'Souza's return to this country. Um, he served a 10 month um, ban for betting breaches out in Hong Kong, of course, that was reciprocated over here. 
Um, he rode a double at Lingfield on Friday and then rode the Doncaster Mile winner Charin at Doncaster on Saturday. He sub subsequently said that championship, uh, obviously he's a three-time championship winning jockey, um, that that isn't necessarily at the forefront of his mind at the moment. But knowing him and his specific brand of determination and the array of contacts he's built up over the last couple of years, um, I would be surprised if when the official start of the flat season, which of course is on 2000 Guineas Day, begins, um, he's not trying to get himself into a very good position in order to potentially um, regain his crown back. William Buick and Oshie Murphy, I'm sure, will have something to say about that. But for me, all these different strands, um, they just make for a really exciting beginning of the flat season, and I can't wait to see how it unfolds. I think interpersonal relationships between jockeys and trainers are always interesting, and there's been so much change in the ranks this year. We'll see how that plays out in the summer months. Um, loads of interesting things to talk about from the early knockings of the flat season, Jonathan. Um, Muddy um, talked there about Sylvester D'Souza um, and his uh, big start to 2024. Had the Doncaster Mile winner on Saturday's World Charing uh, for Roger Verin. That could be an interesting association with those two potentially uh, building through the year. But I guess for him it was important to hit the ground running because although he went to Hong Kong because that's a a fantastic environment to be in. He got a really good offer. One reason was things weren't going as well for him in Britain as they maybe had in the past, which made a move attractive and therefore returning to Britain, almost because you've been forced to return to Britain, it was important that he did make a good start and he has. Yeah, it felt a lot like a statement of intent really and a sort of fresh start, even in the interviews afterwards. I know he was on, on Luck on Sunday as well. This idea that he's sort of drawn a line under Hong Kong, it seems to put a bit of fire in his belly that he needs to right that wrong and just really almost set the record straight in Britain because he had started to slightly drift. He obviously had the King Power retainer. Things weren't going as well as they had previously. You don't suddenly become a bad jockey overnight just because the, the bad horses dry up a little bit. And I think if people are more likely to use him, if people are sort of giving him another chance, he, he has, like you mentioned there, Maddie, he has the contacts book to have a serious crack at it. I think he could be value in that sort of jockey's title uh, race. I know we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. <laughs> I know a lot of people also just shrug their shoulders at that as sort of secondary to the rest of the season, but I, I do like a little jockey's title race if we can have one. And I think he's an interesting, because you know it won't be for want of getting about and trying and mm. riding horses. His, his work ethic's incredible. Um, so too are William Buick and Asheen Murphy, but I and Ross Orion. And Ross Orion, of course, who's quite short in the betting. And Tom Marquan, we can't yeah. forget. There's, there is a, well, yeah. there's a great crop of jockeys, isn't there, at the moment? One of them, David Egan, has a big new job, which he started in style um, last week. Yeah, as I say, on Arizona Blaze, that was a first winner as well for the first season. So I had Sergei Prokofiev and with a Lincoln winner. I think these roles are very important, as you say, similarly to Sylvester, to start with real momentum and winning a Lincoln and winning it pretty easily too is a good way to go about it. We know that role is somewhat of a poison chalice now. We've had Ross Orion in it. He's also still rode for Ammo after it. And, and Kevin Stott, of course, last season rode King of Steel to, to big race success. He's one of the horses that Ammo Racing have got to look forward to this season, among many others. We're seeing, as usual, they've um, poured a lot of money into their young stock. They've got a lot of early two-year-olds already out and on the scene. Um, so fascinating to see how many of those can develop into Royal Ascot contenders and the like. Um, it's a shame in a way that we won't see David Egan riding for Roger Varian as much because they bought, built together a really good partnership. Um, you know, the likes of Elder Elderov in, in the Irish St. Ledger last season was a great success, for instance. Um, but that in turn, I think, is going to open up doors for James Doyle. So it's uh, some doors open and some doors close, but have no doubt that David Egan is among the, the best jockeys in the world at the moment. Again, he's incredibly experienced when it comes to different racing jurisdictions. He's been in India, um, Japan, he's been all over, really, I think. So um, looking forward to seeing what he can do in that position because we know that he's proven on the big stage. You know, at such a young age, he had that introduction with the likes of Mishrif on on uh, the, the Saudi Cup night, etc. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a good moment, I think, for jockeys at the moment. We've got a really good crop of likeable, enthusiastic, talented um, young men and women in the weighing room. Uh, and also in jockey news last week, uh, it was confirmed that Shami Heffernan 
has left his full-time role of many years uh, with Ballydore. Like to ride more for Paddy Toomey this season. Also from Ballydore last week, we had uh, Aidan O'Brien talking about um, exciting plans for City of Troy, who, if, and clearly it's a big if, if he comes through the 2000 Guineas and Derby, might even turn up at Saratoga uh, in the uh, in the Travers Stakes. So um, even from, from, from Ballydore, early signs that th this, this could be a huge year. And hopefully so, because the, the flat season does need a big name. We've been quite spoiled, obviously, with Frank, who is the, the OG, as it were. And then we've had Baid as well. We have, you need a big name. Enable. Na yeah, Enable. You need a sort of a, a big name and a big horse to hang it on. Um, I think, you know, the way they're talking about City of Troy, it feels a bit early for me before the Grand National has been run. But the way they're talking about City of Troy is a little bit as though he is the second coming. I hope he is, because it will be great if he can win a Guineas win a derby and then we're starting to talk about you know might they look at a saint ledger it doesn't seem like that that was mentioned was it the saint ledger but they're probably getting ahead of themselves anyway very talented horse he's done it as a two-year-old but it i don't know what you guys think it it strikes me as a little bit mad that a horse could be odds on for the 2000 guineas this early yeah a little bit um and there is an element of me as well that knows that this is sort of part of the Ballydor circus is to talk up their, their horses as stallion prospects. But at the same time, this is a horse who has delivered on the track and his future is extremely exciting. And there is the prospect of, of dirt racing there, given that he's by the Triple Crown winner, Justify. And again, another huge thing that we've got to look forward to, I know you're saying it's early and it is, but last season's big talking horse, August Ronan's going to make his reappearance yeah. this weekend in the Dubai Shima Classic. Uh, that's going to be a real thriller. Can't wait to see him. Clearly, you know, things haven't always gone right for him. We saw that in the Guineas last year. Um, but great that he remains in training, and that's really exactly what we need when it comes to getting excited about these horses. Um, with the international stage in mind, we should point out that on Saturday, William Haggis and Tom Marquand teamed up to uh, win at Rose Hill with Post Impressionists, who could go on and march through the, the Sydney Autumn Carnival. So... Um, Big news there. Yeah, Via Sistina as well, a big yeah. winner, of course. Was that the round that she won? Yeah, for Chris Waller there now. There go. Yes, um, Place de Carousel was behind her. That's another former European horse over there. It just strikes me how much depth there is in those ranks because they're stealing all our horses, Lee. Yeah, they're stealing some, <laughs> they're stealing some very good ones too. Um, OK, that then was our third story. And that brings up the full complement of discussion points in this week's show. Time for me to decide who has this week's winning story. It's relatively straightforward, I think, this week. Ashley Barnes, the, uh, the footballer who was disqualified by the BHA. That's clearly a story uh, that was uh, discussed for good reasons. Uh, and the start of the flat season, Maddie, uh, very exciting. But it is just the start of the, the flat season. And there is nothing bigger than the Cheltenham Festival, which we promise not to discuss next week. But this week, Jonathan Harding, you have the winning story. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you to Jonathan. Thank you to Maddie. Thank you to you for watching. We will be back again next week. Until then, bye-bye.